Welcome everyone to Virtual Dental Offices Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Justin Scott. I'm here today with Ankit Patel. And I'll go over your list of all your your attributes, at least the ones I looked up on, on LinkedIn. But you can I'll let you elaborate and tell me a little bit more about what they mean because I know they're I wouldn't be able to give a great definition of what some of these things are. So the first thing is that you're the CEO of Classic Vision and you're not an optometrist, but your wife is an optometrist, right? That's correct. Yeah. So you run the business side, you're the brains behind it. You make it go. Your background is you have a bachelor in sciences in industrial engineering and a master's in positive organization, organizational development. And uh, man, that sounds like an awesome thing to have if you if, if i hired somebody to run my company i would be like this guy really knows what the heck he's doing <laughs> and then now you started your own business doing something similar to what we're doing called my business care team but you're focused mainly on trying to hire virtual team members for people in optometry practice because that's your bread and butter that's what you're really good at so Tell me a little bit about your history and background. And and I know you started working in optometry. I I like to hear how that came about. I know your wife is an optometrist, but, and then how this all developed to eventually starting to place virtual team members in other offices. Yeah, it's, it's funny. It's, it was a windy road. Out of college, I worked at a giant manufacturing company at Dell. So doing in the manufacturing facilities, they decided to sell those off and get rid of most of the staff. So I was one of those folks. But while I was there, I became their head lean Six Sigma, their lean person for three of the facilities that they had. And they sold those facilities off. And then I started my own consulting company at that point. So um, I was doing some consulting work, got some work working with the Cleveland Clinic as well. So I started my, that was my first job and first work in healthcare was doing things like Lean Six Sigma in the healthcare space. Fast forward a little bit, my wife and I met, we got, we get married and we bought her a practice. And so I helped her start her practice or get her, get it off the ground for the first six months that we had it. Then I went back to my consulting work. Once I, once we had our first child, I'd got tired of traveling. We looked at, and I started looking at her business. I was like, this is a good business. I like this business model. And she was like, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to make a decent living, but I don't work as much. I said, okay, you probably need to scale the business a little bit. And so we found another practice for sale. And so I, I started doing this full time. So we've been expanding and trying to grow the optometry practices for about 10, 10 11 years now. So yeah. That's, awesome. that's how I, that's how I got into the field. So that's cool. And I knew you were in the field and at first I thought you were an optometrist, but then I realized after doing some more research that, that you're the brains behind the whole thing, but it's, it's interesting with your background. I'm interested in hearing when you look at an optometry practice from an industrial engineer perspective, and even from perspective of which you're training for positive organizational development. What do you see differently than you think the average person does for optometry practices or like smaller type optometry practices or, or dental practices? I'm trying to find the parallel there. Yeah. It's funny because um, uh, one of the things I did for my consulting company was lean. So lean manufacturing, Toyota production system. And people have tried to apply it with some success to dental offices as well as um, optometry offices. But I look at it a little differently. So my first thing is, okay, what does the patient really want? What are they willing to pay for? What do they find valuable? And starting from there. So not everyone has the same patient base. I think that's the first thing to highlight. So if you're a Medicaid practice, it's going to be a very different experience than if you're a boutique dental practice or boutique optometry office. And your customer base is different. They're going to value different things. So you have to understand what they really value, what they really want. And in the Medicaid facility, you really have two customers, but effectively one, right? You're probably, most of your revenue comes from the government. They're really effectively your customer or your end 
client. Now you do have the person in front of you and there are options there, but the primary focus is on making sure you get paid from the government versus the boutique industry. It's really about what the patient experience is like and what they're willing to do and what they want to do and what that feels like. And so what you do is you work backwards from there. So the first scenario, it's a, it's probably going to be a much more high volume, low touch, get them in, get them out, process insurance really efficiently. The second scenario is probably going to be more cash heavy. And it's going to be more about the patient experience and how do they feel when they come in. You might give paraffin vac waxes or something, do something. It must be a, uh, it's probably going to be a nicer experience when you go into the office. And so you design your operations around that with first, and then you work backwards from there. So for us, we're a little bit more high-end boutique optometry office. In the industry, the standard is 15 minute exams. We do 30, we started off with doing 45 to an hour long exams. And we typically don't go any faster than 30 minute exams because we want to give that extra time for the patient and develop specific custom prescription plans for each of the patients. And then when we do that, then our opticians take over and say, okay, we can fill your prescription plan here. So that's a value proposition that we have that's different than let's say like an America's best or a value works or vision works is another brand that's out there that's all about volume and getting people in and out. Um, that's one perspective. The other perspective I also look at is what kind of staff do you need to support that type of environment? If you're running more of a volume shop, you need people who can execute who are productive and fast. If you want a better patient experience, you need people who can also provide that as well. So it depends on what you're trying to create to the type of skill sets and the personalities and people and the organization you create around it. That makes total sense. Yeah. And I imagine these days it, it is for us. And I hear from a lot of other people that hiring is more challenging than it's ever been in your business, correct? Absolutely. And so that actually leads me to the uh, my business care team. We started about four years ago. Actually, I think you were the one that one of the people that inspired me to try it was to hire a person in the Philippines to help with our phone services. And we hired a manager first and the first couple of months were good. She was just there supplementing and helping out our existing team. And then COVID hit. And then we were like, you know what? We can already make our phones remote. And instead of having people come in the office, why don't you guys start taking the phones? So that way we don't have to come in and answer phones. And so we started building out our team, remote team from that point forward. And since then it's grown and we did it for about three or four years. And now we were to the point where other optometrist office started asking us for support and help. And so we took the whole process of what does a patient really want and need? And how do we use the phones to support that? At the same time, there's only so much money that people will allocate and budget and spend in any particular office. And you want to be, we want to be good financial stewards as well. So part of what we have done is when we took the phones out of the office, we started adding more work and more, more to the plate of the offshore team. As we did that, we were able to, to hire less people, but we paid them more. We started offering benefits. And so we ended up making a great place to work, having less people to manage by doing that. So it was a win-win for everyone. Folks in the Philippines were great. They had great stable jobs. Folks here in the US got really good stable jobs that paid better, they had benefits, and patients were happy because they didn't hear the phone ring all the time in the office. They didn't have, people weren't getting distracted. It was just focused on the patients themselves. Yeah. And we we're having the same thing with our office. And we really feel like our staff is able to spend a lot more time with the patients as opposed to being distracted by answering the phones, the insurance, and then all the other many things that typically they would be distracted by. It really allows our high value team members to really focus on giving a great experience for the patients. And if that's part of your business model to be a, you know, high touch sort of boutique type place, and that's where what we do as well, then it makes a lot of sense to take anything out of their hands and give it to someone else that can be supportive. Definitely interested in hearing more about your realization moments of when you started working with VAs where you're like, realize this really does, this is really powerful. This really works well. Can you tell me some stories about that? Like how you realized that this was something that you wanted to dive into more? 
Yeah, well, there was a couple of moments. One, I'll give you the patient perspective. When I had a patient come and tell me, man, that person on the phone, she was great. Whatever her name is, she needs to raise. That's what they told me, right? Because they, they really went above and beyond. And, and so I was like, oh, that, that was really nice to hear that, to get validation from the patients. Um, the other thing I will say that was an aha moment was I realized that I, at first my staff used it as a crutch. It's, oh, it's them that made the issues. But then what I noticed was as time went on, they actually made fewer and fewer mistakes and they were actually learning and they were adhering. And so their error rate went way below anyone I would have in office working that role. And typically that role in the office, they're doing multiple things, not just answering the phones, but they were, they became much more effective at it than my internal staff to the point where I was looking at the data in terms of error rates. And I was like, oh, wow, they're so much better than anyone we've ever had in the office. So that, that was a real aha moment too. Yeah. That, that was one of the aha moments for me is learning that you could use VAs to actually help audit error rates. The finding the time to do that before was really impossible. I don't know exactly to the degree you do, but we have with all of our teams, we have report cards for pretty much everything now. And our typical staff wouldn't have time to put all that stuff together, but our team's able to do that and we're able to to monitor people's performance. And I think once they're seeing their performance in front of them, they naturally get better. What is measured is typically going to improve. And I never really had thought about that. I just knew that we had sometimes things didn't go right and people got angry. And that was the motivation for me originally to start auditing things closer. But that was... You know, that was my main thing is to be able to give it a great experience. We've got to be able to eliminate errors and eliminate issues. And so when I started using it for auditing, that's one of the things that to me was really impactful for my team to help them be better. So I don't know if you yeah, did. We, that was one of the first functions we took on as well. And we actually use it as a catch-all as well. So they're auditing, but it's also, there's, they wake up to a report saying, hey, these are things that you might want to check out. They look like they don't look right because they, they don't know everything, but they know enough to know, hey, these look off. You need to go fix them or address them. And my team knows to go fix them and address them. So it's been helpful as a, a checks and balances system. Yeah, that's exactly how we use it. You know, they make sure that they put their notes in, make sure that things were processed properly. Yep make sure that they were sent off to the insurance and they run those reports. And so one of the most powerful things I like with the VAs is their ability to aggregate things so that my office manager, whoever doesn't have to go looking for the data because the data is all there. It's just getting it all in one place so that they can review it quickly. Like for me, I want it sent to me in WhatsApp. That's just my easiest way that I can, uh, process information. And I don't want to click on the link and go into the spreadsheet. Just send it to me in a way that I can just click it and see it, it comes yeah. up as a picture and I can see it. And that's just the fastest, most efficient way for me to do it. And I've trained my office managers to do it similar to simplify it. And then we even take this multiple reports and condense them down because eventually when you get so many of these, there's too many yeah. reports. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you you recommend everyone get as many VAs as we do, but uh, I think just starting off with getting a few or one or two, I think a lot of people start to see the power and value of having great employees at a reasonable cost. It's just I, not possible I, here anymore in the states. <laughs> yeah, the folks who have the most success get two or more to start off with. Because they're, they're human beings too, right? So there's a training curve. There's the, what if someone's out, something happens, right? And if just having one, if it's not perfect, it's it can sour the experience, right? And so then people get turned off. Like, oh, it just didn't work for me. And that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes you just got to work through some of the challenges. So if you have two, you get to see, okay, this one's good, but this one is having challenges. Let's replace the one that's having challenges with someone that's good. So we like folks who get two or more. It ends up, they have a better experience as well with it. Yeah, it takes out the risk of someone having experience. We've started with one with most people. We haven't had anyone have a, a bad experience. Like maybe we're just lucky at this point. We haven't placed quite as many as you so far, but, but no, I think that's a great idea. Just 
because it's always not everyone's not a good fit and then timing some people have all sorts of family issues and things that come up that's just life in general i think happening um i want to hear a little bit more about you blew my mind last time we talked at breakfast when you were talking about how you think about the process and i think it was your industrial engineering side coming out about how you map out you were talking about mind mapping you were talking about how to how you think about not just from a va perspective but from an employee perspective how you map out an organization could you speak to a little bit about how you do that with i want to say my bcat but your bcat oh, yeah. <laughs> with your company my bcat to to help optometrists harness this the power of the virtual assistants yeah in- most of our folks are inbound phone support and that's where we specialize is the phone piece of it. And so we actually have a four phased approach. In the first phase, we have the phase of hiring and on-ramp, mainly hiring and developing the SOPs or standard operating procedures. And so they're running in parallel. So with the hiring process, we have a pretty robust system where we do all sorts of testing, psychological testing, IQ testing. We have a whole interview process that we go through. And as we're doing that, we'll create the SOPs and standard operating procedures with the clients. So we do that in two parts. The first part is a mind map or a decision tree, a flow chart. So when you make a phone call, okay, what type of phone calls are we going to get? What are possible questions or comments that the patients could make? And then based off of that, how do we answer? What do we do? So we get a high level of agreement of, okay, this is roughly your flow for your office. And then we take that and we turn it into standard operating procedures and fill them out in more detail. We're in the process of taking that and putting it into a chat bot too for each of our clients. Each agent can just type it in a question if they have it and it searches all that for them. But that's that should be, that's about a couple of weeks away, but that should be exciting to see as well. Then we go to phase two, which is the training ramp. During phase one and phase two, we are working with the clients, finalizing the SOPs. In phase two, we have hired the people and now we're training them. So we do English training, cultural training, and industry-specific training. And we have different checkpoints that they have to hit along the way in terms of testing, as well as mock calls and mock scenarios that they have to pass audits for. And then we go into phase three, which is the go-live phase. And in phase three, we have we always measure three, at least three things, something around productivity, something around quality, and something around service level agreement. Usually around the calls, it's quality audit scores for quality. It's how fast or talk time, and that's different per client, but talk time, average talk time for is a productivity metric. And then our SLA is how many calls that we answer. And depending on what the client has decided to get, we know where we should be in terms of number of percentage of calls that we can answer at one given day. And then we do a monitoring, we do a daily monitoring track projects and we do a weekly report on all this. And we track that in over six weeks, we have a ramp period to hit our goals. And then we go to phase four, which is ongoing maintenance and management. So you've got this four phase approach to really get people up to speed. When we do it right and we do it well, we can do it in less than 90 days from start to end. Most companies do it from the time of hire to the time of phase four or ongoing support is 90 days. So that our window of time is about 60 to 72 days for that same period. Wow. Yeah. So with my company, VDO, (laughs) we recommend people don't start with phones because that's the tough challenge. It that's is. the challenging part. Yeah. We do it personally. We have our personal phones, but it's not easy. And it's one of the things that I feel is the most challenging and you have to really keep an eye on it. I think that it's not something for the faint of heart. And the problem with a lot of, if they've got you managing, that makes more sense. But trying to do that on top of seeing patients, to me, that's it's mm-hmm. not really possible. So it brings, it makes your what you're doing super valuable. Our team, we focus on more of, Miss calls and, and overflow calls. And then a lot of our VAs are doing like things like project management or, or at insurance and billing and things like that. But I definitely think that it's great too for a call center, especially a busy place because we've had a call center in our office. And I think it makes sense when you compare it to a regular call center. But in a lot of dental offices, their team answers the phone. Mm-hmm. And if their team's really good at it, man, your VA better, better be very good 
in order to keep up with the way some people are. Now, some people, they aren't good. And then replacing them with VA to me is not that big a deal, but that's a high value, high touch of position, especially in dental when one case could be no. 10, 15, 20, $25,000 that they need to be trained really well. So that's a, yeah. a big challenge. And uh, I definitely think that uh, you guys have a great structure and the average dental practice, they're not going to have this kind of structure or the average optometry. They're not going to have, because it's run by a doctor. We don't have time busy seeing patients and doing everything else like that. No, I think this is awesome. Super valuable for anybody that is looking for virtual teams. But I think that's interesting how you focused in on the call center piece because that that's a challenging, you know? That's why we like it because it's hard. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a lot of other people doing a lot of other things, but most people haven't cracked this nut. So we're trying to crack that nut in the optometry space and ophthalmology space. We do also offer the billing and filing services, but we require you to be a call center person first. Okay. What we end up doing is we take our agents and we train them on this other stuff too. Okay. So that way they get a they get to be really a partner in your business and we manage them. Like you said, they're not managed as much through direct through the team, we actually manage them directly. So you don't have to worry about the management side. Right. That makes total sense. That's cool. What else is new with, we were talking a little bit about AI and how you guys are using chatbots. I saw you're in my, I said, maybe I, I'm in your group, the EO. AI you know, group, group. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, yeah, interesting things. So exciting. All the stuff that's happening with that. So we're training all our VAs to use things like chat GPT, answering reviews with it, answering emails, where all of our marketing, the captions and things like that. We have a lot of VAs that are doing social media and stuff like that. So what are some of the things that you guys are using it for? Um, uh, responding to reviews is a big one, especially, I love how you can just say, this is some of the context. Can you write a review that implements this context without going overboard? So that's been helpful. We also use it for some of our marketing pieces. So creating marketing material, things like that, at least the first pass. So my VAs can then take it and run with it. We're also, like I said, I have a little bit of a programming background. So I've been playing with it and coding our own internal chatbot. So taking all our internal training documents, uploading it. And so anyone can ask a question to our documents and say, Hey, what's going on now? We got to be careful, right? It's in public domain. So it's nothing really proprietary that's in there. It's really just like, Oh, well, this doctor does this day, or this is how we do this process in our office, or this is how this office does that process. But that's been really helpful. Cause then you just type it in and you ask the question, and it spits out a response for you. And then it also takes some of the information off the web and integrates it into a nice, usable, readable format. Yeah, I think that the typical website is only going to be around for a very short period of time. I think you're going to go to a website and it's going to be a chatbot and the things you want will be presented to you based on you have some options or you can put whatever type of random prompt that you want and then it's going to bring you the information in a interesting sort of transitional video type way and uh it would be more UX UI perspective in terms of just surfing websites and things like that. And I don't know, I think that there's probably going to be a lot of opportunity for a guy like yourself who can do programming, take these chat bots and make it into some sort of product that can be just yeah. plugged into an optometry practice. And I think there's similar, and I'm not a programmer. I've been playing with... Uh, python recently just because i uh because i just think it's fun and it's interesting and now yeah, i can just ask chat gpt to you know give me write some the code, code for you. yeah write the code for me so i need to learn know a little bit of it so that i at least can have an idea of what's going on but i'm learning like i feel like 10 times faster than i used to with all this stuff it's inspired me to work harder and do whatever else um tell me a little bit more about your company, I know you guys are growing pretty fast, but tell me a little bit about what else you guys are focused on or what's happening with your company. Yeah. So my business care team, like you said, it's specifically for the optometry and ophthalmology industry. We're focused heavily on inbound calls and taking care of those for our clients. So 
we started doing a lot, right? A lot of VA, a lot of things like VA insurance, billing and filing. And it got, we got really spread thin. So we said, okay, we're going to narrow our focus and say, this is what we're focusing in on. It's been growing really fast. We've had quite a bit of growth. We've been doubling in size every couple of months. And that is, that's been a lot of fun, especially with the operation side, getting that all taken care of. But it's been good. It's been growing fast. People have been really in need of this service and the folks who like it, um, they stay with it for forever. So it's, if you use it, you like it, you get through the first three months of about 90 days of, okay, you got to get the training right. Got to get the nailed in. But once that's done, man, people don't look back. They're like this. I don't know how we lived without it before. Yeah. It's similar experience with us. Very s- sticky that, that everyone tends to, once they find somebody they, that they like, most people really do stick around quite a while. I actually did my first couple of VAs back in 2010 or 11. That was back when... I read the four hour work week yeah. by Tim Ferriss. Yeah. Yep. That's uh, right. But back then it was really hard because the communication, there was no voice over IP. There was not WhatsApp. And so we played with it. We dabbled with it. The last three or four years we've been doing it more seriously in our office. And then just this last year, we've been focused on doing it for other practices you've been doing a little longer than i have but our ideas are similar in the sense that we're focusing on niches that we can think we can have the biggest impact on so our kind of biggest niche is is billing and insurance and verification insurance because it's such a big thing for dentistry i think we can provide a lot of value on that but just having someone do social media man that's been a huge thing as well we're doing a lot of people that are doing social media and project manager, just general virtual assistant uh, that can help people with their email and all that kind of stuff and accounts payable and all those kind of things. Yeah. That's a big one. Accounts payable. We use them too for that a lot. Managing vendor bills. Yeah. Keeping up with all that stuff. It's just a lot of stuff. No one wants to do it in the office when you've seen patients in between patients. True. Cool. Man, I appreciate your time. I don't. I, I want. I'll keep it short because I know you're a busy guy. But uh, we got to get. Some, we got to get some more uh, breakfast, breakfast again them soon. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> and chat. Thanks we'll, for having me on. I appreciate. We'll it. do more chat GPT sometime soon. Chat, good. Chat, chat about that. All right. Well, have a good one, man, and uh, take care. We'll see you soon. Okay. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. Thank you.